Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2 Super Mini Mail Call. And today we have a package here. It looks like it comes from Ottawa, Ontario. Hi to all my Canadian viewers. My father lived in Ottawa for a good number of years, so I spent a good amount of time in the summers and stuff there. And it was actually a really pretty little city. It's the capital city of Canada, if you're not aware. And it has a beautiful canal system that runs all through the city. And in the winter, there's like a, a skating festival or an ice festival or something like that. I remember ice skating on it and having like, uh, you know, hot cinnamony apple cider type drinks and stuff like that. So yeah, really fond memories of Ottawa. Very cold in the winter though. All right, so in the box here, we have a letter. Got some, <laughs> some candy here. Got some Smarties. Oh, and a packet of my favorite ketchup potato chips. And they didn't get too badly crushed in transit. Another box of Smarties. And it looks like we have a box of goodies here. Whoops, uh, hopefully nothing fell out there. Oh, check this out. That's too funny. This actually comes from Mike. And Mike, uh, well, Mike sent in a while back. Uh, Mike has the new retro show on YouTube. Mike sent in a Sega Master System, which I just made a video about on the main channel. So by the time this video comes out, I think that video is probably already going to be released. But yeah, it took me a good long while to actually get to uh, to making that video. Anyhow, here it is. Yo, Adrian, I hope you're well. I found this 36 mainboard a few months ago at a value village. That's a uh, like a thrift store in Canada, I think. And I had them in the US as well, potentially, but I don't think we have any on the West Coast here. I thought, you, uh, I thought you'd like to play with. Also some Ram for Rami the Sheep and Mike from Ottawa. Enjoy the chips and candy. So yes, uh, ketchup potato chips, Lay's, of course, is a very popular brand in the US, but for whatever reason, they do not sell ketchup in the US. You can be in a border town, like in uh, Windsor, Ontario, you can get these. You cross the river to Detroit, you just like look across the river and there's Detroit, Michigan, and you cannot get this. Unless I'm mistaken, I have never seen these for sale anywhere in the US. And of course in Canada, you can get ketchup flavor from many different brands, the store brands, Pringles, Doritos, everything, but not in the US. Why? I don't know. So yeah, I love ketchup, I love potatoes, I love ketchup potato chips. And then Smarties, I've talked about these on the channel plenty of times. You can't get these in the US either for whatever reason. They're just uh, chocolate that's coated in like a hard candy shell. And of course they're available for sale in Canada, but not in the US. Uh, there's something called Smarties in the US, but they're different. They're like a chalky sugar candy. Maybe that's why they don't sell them here. Anyhow, let's take a look at what's in the box here. Houston Technologies, it says Pentium. And uh, the price tag from Value Village here was $9.99 in Canadian uh, dollar dues, as they call them. Hey, take a look at that. That's pretty nice. And what's cool, this has uh, this battery pack here, so it doesn't have one of the leaky destructive batteries that are so common to find on 386 motherboards. Well, let's just unplug that. And there's an extra battery here, which, uh, well, we don't need that either. This motherboard's in really clean shape. So many 386DX motherboards have been destroyed over the years because of the leaky NICAD battery that's on these things. It seemed to be super common. The original AT used a battery pack like this, one of these, um, I don't know if this is actually, this is not lithium, it's alkaline, four and a half volts. So it must have some small cells in there, three of them. But for whatever reason, most of the manufacturers, when they went to making their AT clones and 286s and 386s and some of the 486s, they always put rechargeable NICADs on there, which had the tendency to, well, they all just leak and destroy everything. But this one is in perfect looking shape. I mean, considering this was a thrift store find. Okay, so what can we figure out about who possibly makes this thing? I see some name stuff right here. MTI 3D6 Revision 2C. Is that, is that showing up in camera? Made in the USA. So made its way back to the US after being found at a value village in Canada and then sent back here. And then on the BIOS here, it's a Milex MTI 3D6. And the date there is 10-8-1991. And since this is a USA motherboard, I'm sure the date is the US format, which of course no one else uses in the world, just the US. <laughs> yeah. Pretty ridiculous, isn't it? And uh, Ostec is the chipset micro cache. Well, obviously we have cache memory right here. These are 64 kilobit cache chips. So 
So each one of these is eight bits wide. So you need four of them for 32 bits because of course this is a 32 bit system, meaning that this is 256K and I guess 512K of cash. Not too sure what these quad flat packs are here. T Texas Instrument TACT 8344 ones. Don't know what those are, but this obviously is part of the chipset for this thing because this is another tacked chipset. So I guess Texas Instrument made a 386 chipset. I was fully unaware that that was the case. And then we just have some jelly bean type logic here. These I think are latches and we have a 386DX at 33 megahertz and the requisite math coprocessor also at 33 megahertz. Pretty darn awesome. Funny that the keyboard controller is over here, even though the keyboard connector is over here. They typically put that up there. And yep, this actually has built-in I.O. So that is probably what this IC is right there. It's handling uh, IDE, floppy, parallel, and two serial ports. Kind of unusual for 386DX. And looking at these SIMs, we have eight of them on there. These appear to be one megabyte SIM. So we have a total of eight megs of RAM. And probably you can put four megabyte SIMs in here, giving you a 32 megabyte maximum on this motherboard. Now it doesn't have the extra 32 bit slot that a lot of these have that allow you to add much more memory for your 386 board. So I guess this wasn't like a super high end motherboard. Condition wise, absolutely in wonderful condition. A little interesting little bodge here, a resistor pack is connected up to the ISA bus. I do not immediately see any kind of uh, scratches or damage to this motherboard. It just simply looks really, really good. Quick Google search brings us over to the retro web. Looks like there's the motherboard right there. So two speeds, 25 and 33. And this one obviously is the 33 megahertz variant and the chipset Texas instrument unidentified. There are no pictures here. So I'll make sure to grab pictures of this motherboard and then send them in. So yeah, floppy interface, ID interface, parallel serial slots, and it says cash up to well, 128K, so maybe I miscounted the amount of memory on here. You know what, these might be 8K chips. Actually, now I think about it, these are 8K chips each. So that means this has a total of 64K of cache memory, which makes a lot more sense. I don't know what I was saying earlier, 512 or 256K for 3D6 is completely unusual. And, and that's really because cache memory was very, very expensive early on, like when this motherboard came out. By the time the 46s came out, cache prices were dropping for this uh, high-speed SRAM. So then you started to find like 256K cache and 512K on those motherboards. But yeah, 64K makes much more sense on this. It does coincide here that 32 megabytes is the maximum RAM size and the RAM type is 30 pin memory as we already are aware of. And there's also known as a couple different variants there. And let's see if we have any BIOS to get. Yep, there is a BIOS on here, which is newer than the ones on here. This is 6.08. So I'm gonna have to dump this, upload that also to the retro web. And let's see if there is a manual. Oh yeah, we got a user manual. Is it a PDF? Let's take a look here. Ah, very cool. All right, well, there's not much to worry about because there's not like configuration jumpers on 3D6 motherboards. It's not at all like it was with 46s where you had all the clock multipliers and bus speeds and all that kind of stuff. It was a lot simpler back in the day of the 386. All right, cool. Well, let me uh, grab the power supply and some cards and let's test this thing out and see if this works and can go into the working pile or can go into my repair pile, which is over there. Okay, so for testing, I use this, which is an ATX power supply, just uh, in case anyone is curious. There's the info on it, it's a US CAN. Okay, switch mode power supply, 350 watts, ATX. It supplies a good, healthy amount of five volts at 35 amps. Later ATX power supplies, like newer ones, are just no good, but this are no good for five volts, that is. They put all of their current into the 12 volt rail, but of course, with these older motherboards, they, they do run on just five volts. So you do not need a powerful 12 volt rail. I put a mouse pad down there on top of it. Uh, let's get these little standoffs out of here because uh, that prevents this from really sitting properly. So the old Big Pen mod, I don't remember the name of the viewer who sent this in, but it was a mail call as well. And generally it gets these out pretty well. I think I knew that trick like back in the day when I was working in a computer store, but frankly, not sure I did. Oddly enough, it doesn't always work for getting these out. It just depends on the manufacturer of the little standoff, I guess. And this one is refusing to come out. Let's try this one over here. Okay, that one came right out. And this one, are you gonna behave? Yes, that came right out as well. And the last one here. 
No, that one is misbehaving. Yeah, this one is not working either. So I don't know, like maybe they're made by a different company or something. And when that happens, I have to go to the old way I used to do this, which is needle nose, which is frustrating. And yeah, and then I can get them out with the needle nose like that. There's just not a lot of clearance as well. I don't think I tried this one. Oh, this one, this will come out anyways, because it's in the slotted hole there, which is in the corner. And then this one here is the trouble. Let's just try one more time with the pen. And there's like a bunch of pins right here. So it's really, I'm getting my fingers all messed up. No, that's, it's not working. I really do remember when I was working in the computer store, having to use needle nose pliers like this to get these out. If you have recollection of uh, the way you did it, I'd love to hear about your, your methods for getting these out. You know what? I've, I've had it with that. I've been sitting there struggling. This is going to be, get cut off entirely. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, back to the testing. So pop the motherboard down there onto the power supply. I usually put it this way. And then of course I have this adapter on here, which is ATX to AT. Works really reliably. I've had great luck with this power supply. Connect these connectors up. You always put the uh, black ground cables towards the middle. Plug the power supply in and we're gonna use a postcard first. Not even gonna plug this into any kind of cards other than the postcard here, because I'd like to see this thing actually show a sign of life. And I need to figure out where the speaker goes. It's right here at the edge. And we're ready for power on. Let's see if we see postcodes. If we see postcodes, we're looking good. Oh yeah. Excellent. It's stuck at five, but who knows uh, what kind of bias this is. Oh no, there it goes. It's, it's counting up. Now with motherboards like this, you might need to actually install a turbo jumper to get it to run at full speed. So that can be one of the reasons why it was going pretty slowly there is we just didn't have that jumper installed. So I have a little glass vial here of jumpers and it looks like, let's see, get the right jumper out. I see turbo LED right here. Where is the turbo switch? Reset turbo LED, key lock. Uh, this has cache size, either 64K, 32 or 128. Over here in the corner is mono color, uh, LPT interrupt over there. It says IO enable, so you can disable the, the onboard IO. I'm not seeing the actual speed. There's J11 right here, which I think, oh, right there, hard drive LED. And then right here we have JP3, which appears to be completely unlabeled, which is weird because everything else is labeled. Let's go to the motherboard manual. Oh, you know what? Forget that. Let's just plug this in. I find a VGA cord here. All right, I think we're on the right input, maybe. Let's just double check. By... Okay, wow, what was that? Did you see that? It went, boo! <laughs> That's cute. Wow, this is an interesting BIOS here. It's kind of unusual in that it's uh, a different. P for the post display, any other to skip memory test. It's a very slow RAM test, which kind of makes me think that this thing is not running at the turbo speed. So we'll plug this in here. Oh, uh, I was under the impression it had eight megs of RAM because there were one meg SIMs, but I'm assuming actually we have 16 in these four, and then we have another four here. So it probably has 20 megabytes of memory because I'm pretty sure these the ones I could see when I looked at the board there, those are definitely one meg memory modules. While this is counting down, I'm scrolling through the manual here trying to find out if there's a turbo jumper, key lock, hard drive, speaker, mono color, cache. No, I don't think there's a turbo setting. So this must be something that's con configured with software. All right, there we go. Did you see it got to 20 and then started again. So P, I don't know, skip memory test. Okay, I don't think the keyboard is working. Oh, there we go. Whoa, look at this. <laughs> what is this? Is this wild? I'm not seeing this. EMOS RAM checksum failed. Oh no, and keyboard failed because I probably plugged it in after it powered up. Clock not ticking correctly. Run setup. Warning. Math coprocessor hardware incorrect. Run setup. Oh, it's beeping at me now. Okay, we're gonna press F2 for setup. I just I've taken in everything we're seeing here. Yeah, this is uh this is wild. I'm I'm kind of this is an unusual bias, I have to say. Okay, so if we hit F2, 
Okay, the keyboard is not working. Oh, oh yeah, it's working. All right, look how slow that was at drawing there. This thing must not be running in fast speed. It does say speed high. Memory cache enabled. All right, so we'll just set any kind of random date. How do we do that here? 2000, no, no. Page up, page down, nope. Oh boy, I'm, I'm pushing buttons here. Plus and minus, that's how you do it. Press enter. It's funny, it says plus and minus to change, but I'm pushing plus and minus, and that is not doing anything. So I don't actually know how to set the time and date. I can type stuff, it doesn't really do anything. Hmm. All right, whatever, we'll just leave that for now. Okay, so everything here is looking good. We're gonna leave everything disabled. Oh, look at that, hard drive types, that's cool. The BIOS shadow, I'd like that enabled, please, but it's not, not letting me do anything. Math co-processor installed, diagnostic loop. Oh, there are three pages here. Ah, video shadowing, nice. Enable, disable the IO, very cool. That's kind of cool for such an old motherboard. Non-cache region one, so you can tell it to not cache part of the RAM. I don't know why you do that. I've seen that on the motherboards. Maybe there were certain performance implications with certain programs, they wouldn't work properly, something like that. But that's all disabled right now. So, okay, we're looking good. So we hit S for save and reboot. And I think hopefully it may not work actually. Sometimes the clock doesn't even run if you don't have a battery connected. So I may need to connect something to this thing. Let's try to skip this and see if it complains. Extended memory. And then I'm going to plug in my IDE card and the uh, ROM for the XT IDE here. Okay, diagnostics completed successfully. All right, let's plug this stuff in here. So the first little board is a ROM board that allows the XT IDE to work. So we don't have to worry about the BIOS settings, not supporting like this compact flash card, something like that. But so far this thing is in like complete mint condition. I love that like little animation it does. That is absolutely cool. I wonder how we get into, I'm hitting P for post display. I don't want to test all the RAM again. Oh, there we go. How do we get to the setup? F2? So when there was an error, it gave us an option to go Oh, there we go, I pushed F2. Okay, can I change the date now? No, I don't really get this. It really does say plus and minus keys to change at the bottom, but down here on, for instance, this, I'd like to change this. So I'm hitting plus, minus. Only thing I'm thinking of is that this is a, a numlock thing. and I don't have an extended keyboard on the computer. So that's that's gotta be what it is. So page up, page down, that doesn't do it. Let's see, left, right. No, left, right just is the same as pushing up and down. So that doesn't do it. I want to turn on the BIOS cache. That, that would speed up the computer, computer dramatically. Spacebar doesn't do it. Enter key doesn't do it. Very odd. And yeah, plus and minus doesn't do it. Hitting shift or no shift doesn't make a difference. Anyways, okay, well, let's boot this thing up and let's see how fast it really is running because I can run some benchmarks once this uh, system here boots up with my card. And I can dump the BIOS as well, so I can upload that. And then I can grab the photos of this, and we can upload those to uh, RetroWeb. So there'll be some good high-res pictures, including of the chipset there. So there it is. There's the BIOS running. That's on this card right here. And then this 16-bit ISA card just didn't work. That's weird. And it's funny how the green light is just on, solid on here. It did detect, am I mistaken? It detected the compact flash card, right? That's very interesting. This thing's so non-standard that it's just not happy with the XT IDE. I mean, I've used it on so many things. Checking floppy drive. Floppy drive's not even enabled. Why are you doing that? Checking option ROM. Oh no, it didn't find it. All right, let's, um, I wonder if there's some incompatibility. I'm gonna take the postcard out. Don't need that. Wow, I, I mean, I've used this card so many times on so many. Oh, of course it's not gonna work. There's onboard IDE. I have to disable that somehow. Well, I'm gonna change this jumper right here. That's for the enable or, uh, yeah, this one right here is enable IO. So maybe that'll, <laughs> I'm like, people will probably scream at the screen. Of course the IDE card's not gonna work because there's onboard IDE. I mean, I could plug a, one of these compact flash adapters into there, but I have to go dig in the drawer to find it. Let's see if that has disabled everything by taking that jumper off. Maybe that's for the floppy drive. So this has a floppy controller. That's just, oh yeah, there it is, InnoDisk. Okay, cool. So that jumper does disable the whole onboard IO just like that. And there we go. 
Easy peasy. This really does feel kind of slow, even though this is a 33 megahertz system. Yeah, there's no Pico Gus on this machine. Well, let's uh, let's run Top Bench. See how fast we're going here. Now it's a Surus Logic video card. Oh yeah, of course that doesn't work either. We will need to reboot and hold down Shift so EMM386 is not running. Props to Milex Corporation for you know trying to uh, to do that little animation with the Milex Corporation <laughs> goes down the screen. I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stuck key. Give me a break. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was holding the shift key down already. Okay, let's see. Please bypass the startup config. There we go. All right, so first we'll start with Speed 600. This is Jim Leonard's most hated program. I just have to throw that out there. Right, 33 megahertz. It is good to go. So we're running at the equivalent, according to this benchmark, of a 57 megahertz IBM PCAT 5170. So with the machine right there, I have an 8 megahertz version and it scores around 8 megahertz in here and this thing is way faster. So to think, well, that year, the, what year did that come out in? 5170, 1984, I think. So not that many years later, 19, um, 1991, when this came out, look at that speed increase. Of course, you could get 386s even earlier than that, but this is, you know, it had started to condense down because it has access. Uh, well, the early 386s are really big motherboards. They're full-size AT. And the reason why they were able to condense it is because they started getting these chipsets here that really compress things. This, of course, has cache memory, which does help things out. So we can go into cache check, which is a good DOS utility here. That will, I need to keep an eye on the time here. It's 311. Um, this will be able to detect exactly how much cache memory is available. Now, if you look at the, what it's doing here, is it's doing some performance loops with the DRAM and the measurement is microseconds per kilobyte. And you notice from 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32K, that is all, or, and 64K, that is running at basically 47, 48 microseconds per kilobyte. But then as soon as it tries to read a larger block, 128K, then it is running at 78 microseconds per kilobyte. So we're basically almost doubling the performance, not quite doubling, but you know, we're getting a, a market improvement in RAM performance anytime uh, the program you're running is working within that first 64K of RAM. And that's why having like a larger L2, well, this is an L1 cache because there's no L1 cache inside these chips at all. Like a 486 has cache in the die, 386 does not. So this is now considered L1 cache. Anyhow, like it does give you a big performance improvement, but much less so than the L1 cache that's inside the die on say a 46, that's much, much faster. And the L2 cache is what you had externally with these cache chips, which incidentally, very, very warm, but this is gonna run and it's gonna count all the way up to 20 megabytes. This is just ensuring that all of the 20 megs of RAM that are on this board are being cached correctly because certain motherboards could only cache like the first 16 megs of RAM and the timing here would change. The reason why it's just showing zero, one, and then now it's just two, three, four, you know, through 12, that's because the timing that it's getting on each additional megabyte is exactly the same as that second line, essentially, where up to four megabytes there, it has uh, 78 microseconds per kilobyte. So this motherboard may only cache the first 16 megs of RAM, and this will tell us that because as soon as we go past 16, it'll slow down on all of the memory access on those higher megabytes. So this utility here written by, was it Ray Van Tassel here back in 1998, 95 through 98, this is a very useful utility on all of your DOS systems to really identify if you're having performance issues like with the caching and things like that. I'm sure if we went to the BIOS and we disabled some of that caching, had those settings in there, um, I'll look same as above, yep. Yeah. Uh, then it would show up in here. We'd be able to tell that. And the program would be able to identify that. So there it is, L1 cache, which is the only cache, is 64 kilobytes. It identified that for sure. And it's running at 23.1 megabytes per second. And the onboard memory speed, when it's not being cached, is 14.2 megabytes per second. So yeah, it's not quite double, but still a big improvement. Also, this is a useful test. If you go into your BIOS settings and if you have parameters in there to manipulate, for instance, things like um, cache or DRAM timing, you can see those performance changes with this utility. It's pretty, it's pretty cool for that. So we can run Top Bench here. This is Jim Leonard's program that he wrote for benchmarking, and it will run here. And uh, you know, my little like small complaint about this program, I mean, it's not really a complaint. My observation is that this program gives a performance metric here, and this machine is getting a score of 56. But that includes your video card. So if I had a really slow video card on here, a big chunk of the score is based on the video card performance. So therefore. 
If you're just looking to find out like what your RAM and CPU performance is, you have to ignore the total score and just look at opcodes and MEMEA because the vid mem performance metric has a lot to do with the card that's running on your system. And you can see for the computer that it's comparing this to, which is a Cyrix 46 clone, it got a score of 51. The MEM test uh, was very similar, and the MEM EA is actually faster on the 46, but slower on this system. Opcodes is also slower on this system, but the video memory performance on this computer here, because I'm running a Cirrus Logic video card versus that junky Trident 8900, is, is, is affecting the score and giving me a higher score than that Cyrix thing. So like computationally, the Cyrix 46 is faster than this motherboard, but overall, if you're encountering something that's using the memory card or the video card, this machine is actually faster. So the total there of microseconds is 970 or whatever. And on the Cyrix there, it was 1030. So I'm gonna use the utility ROM dumper, which also was written by Jim Leonard. And this program, oops, is uh, really useful at dumping all the ROMs on a system, including the system BIOS ROM. It's good for really old systems like this, where the BIOS ROM doesn't have any partitions or like memory tables and things happening in it. This doesn't really work well for much later systems that do have those, but for old systems like this, where the ROM chip that's on the motherboard is just directly mapped into the memory space on the system, it's perfect for those. So I'm gonna make a directory called, what is this? Is it a Milex or Hyrex? I already forgot, I think it was a Milex. So we're gonna go into Milex directory there, and then we'll run the ROM dumper utility which will dump all of the ROMs that it's gonna find. Now, if we look at what it's just dumped, the only ones that are really relevant here are the F0000 through FFFF. That is the system ROM, 64 kilobytes. Those other ROMs there are like the XT IDE ROM that's on this card, and I think the VGA ROM. So we can kind of ignore those. Anyhow, that's a successful dump of the ROM. I don't even need to take this chip out of here, and then we can uh, just take the compact flash card out, put it in the system, and then poke around in that ROM BIOS. So back on my Windows 10 computer, there are the ROMs that we just dumped. And let's take a look at this first one here and we'll open it up in the hex editor. And this should be it. Yep, that's it, Milex Corporation and like a bunch of gobbledygook, which is the actual ROM itself. And if we open up the other file, which is the second half here, uh, there it is. So I, ideally these are actually a combined file and I'm assuming the chip that's on the motherboard is actually gonna be uh, 27C512 which I think off the top of my head is 64 kilobit, kilobits or kilobytes or kibibytes as it's, as it's called. And you can see there's a bunch of blank space in here, but uh, yeah, there it is. MTI 3D6 ISA BIOS 6.08. So, but we can just copy these two files here, F000 and we're gonna copy F8000 and I think this is the right syntax and we're gonna copy this to mylex. 608.bin and we do slash b to tell it it's a binary file, I think. And now we should have a 3K file. So that did not work. <laughs> what did I do wrong here exactly? So slash b is for binary file. How do you concatenate different things together? I really thought it was the uh, the plus command that you did there. What if we what if we don't do that? No, nope, syntax incorrect. It did not like that. Maybe we need to put the slash B at the front. Let's try that. That worked. That's unusual. I don't know. Maybe I'm forgetting my DOS commands. I always thought you could put the slash at the end and it would work. Maybe that's a Unix thing or a Linux thing. I don't know. Okay, well, let's open up this file now. The, uh, the full size one. I made a dot ROM. And we should have the whole thing now. Um, hopefully you can see this here. We should have the whole thing all the way down to the end. Yep. That looks correct. And 6A was the last byte we had. And yeah, okay, cool. So now I just need to snap some pictures of this motherboard and then send this over to RetroWeb, all well, the photos of it, high-res pictures front and back, and then a copy of the BIOS as well. And then at least there'll be a nice, good quality picture for this very mint condition motherboard. So that's pretty awesome. I have to say, Mike, if this was really $10 at Value Village, that is a wonderful price and an absolute score for a 386DX motherboard and one that has absolutely no damage on it and has the built-in multi-IO plus 20 megs of RAM and a math coprocessor. 
all really good things for making an excellent retro PC. And I really appreciate you finding that and then thinking of me and sending it along with these snacks as well to me here in the basement. That is freaking awesome. And if, as I said before, if you wanna check out Mike's YouTube channel, you can do so. Here is the URL right there. And Mike, thank you very much again for sending in that Sega Master System on a previous mail call episode, which I have now since repaired. And uh, yeah, video should be on the main channel. So awesome, thanks very much, Mike. All right, let's move on to another package. The uh, yellow DHL package is from, from the UK. Alan in the UK. Hi to all my UK viewers. Looks like Alan's from Nottingham. And it looks like this got the old repack seal on here. So hopefully they didn't uh, mess that up too much when they inspected it or whatever they did. And this looks like it was DHL inspected. It wasn't even US Customs. So uh, maybe DHL thought something was a little suspicious with potential retro goodies inside of a box. Inside we have a little uh, package here that has DHL tape on it. So I'm assuming it means it was inspected by them. Yeah, it looks like they uh, opened and repacked all of this stuff. Kind of odd. I don't think I've had that, especially not by the shipping carrier themselves. Also, it doesn't appear that there was any kind of note with this. So hopefully uh, we can figure out what this is exactly. I wonder if they took a look at all these wires and they were like, oh, that's super suspicious. Why are there wires inside a box? That doesn't make any sense. Oh, all right. Yeah, Pico RC. I love the Pico RC. I have so many of these kits that Alan has sent in and these are all replacement power supplies. Well, I'm assuming these are replacement power supplies for our beloved retro computers. What is this? Okay. The IBM PC PSU adapter. How does this work? So we have a 3D printed slot cover. We might just have to go to that website and we can check out everything. We got a power switch, a couple LEDs or an LED, and I assume this is the uh, DC barrel jack for the Pico ATX. Do I have a Pico ATX floating around? Not handy, but a Pico ATX is a little ATX power supply that just connects here. It's about, it's about yay big, and it has a 12 volt DC barrel jack, which you would mount right here. And that means you could power up your computer minus the, the entire power supply. Okay, and I, I think I see what's going on here. This is ingenious, actually, freaking ingenious. It's powering the computer right from the ISA bus, which you know what? That's totally acceptable. Oh, wait, what? <laughs> is this an, <laughs> this is an Amstrad floppy disk? A brand new one? Yes, I just recently had Amstrad stuff on the channel, and um, I think this is one of the floppies. Anyhow, okay, so what we got here, I'm um, gonna we'll have to look at the manual again, or the, what we see on the website. So it looks like this plugs into, for instance, this spade connector here. So we have ground. And then, I think what, and then I think what happens is you take this and you actually connect it onto the motherboard power connector because you don't wanna necessarily supply five volts to the entire power or the entire motherboard just through the ISA slots alone. So it's probably a good idea to connect a high or heavy duty wire like one of these directly to the motherboard power connector for the five volts, the ground, and the power good signal as well. So this is freaking great. And look at this, a little 3D printed cover here. So you can stick this in the IEC connector on the back of your um, power supply that you just leave inside the computer. So if that power supply is dead, you can just unplug it from the motherboard, put this into the back so you don't plug a power cable into it, stick this in the motherboard, and then you would just feed your entire PC through this DC 12 volt barrel jack. And this would just power everything up. I have to admit that is an amazing use and a, such an easy way to install something like this, especially if you're not technical and you're not comfortable opening up your old power supply. Okay, so before we go check out the website to look at the, the details on these, and by the way, these are usually all open source. So you can just you know go and download the plans yourself. Uh, they're also sold as kits like this, fully assembled. Let's see what these are. All right, so this is a new revision of this. It's the ATX4 VC, so four vintage computer. And what this is, is a very simple and easy breakout from an ATX connector, has fuses on board, and then you can um, add some clip type connectors on here. And there are some right here. I guess there are different styles for depending on what you want, but this is the type of connector you would put in there. So you would solder this on to the board like that. Got a little bit of tape on my finger there. And then it allows you to very easily connect up the wires here. So for instance, if you had a dead power supply of whatever your computer is, you could cut the cable that goes from the motherboard into the power supply. And if you're able to figure out there's a five volt, 12 volt, minus five volt, then you just connect it to the appropriate wires right here, 
plug your Pico ATX into this, and then you do have to run uh, a barrel jack somewhere and a power switch somewhere, and you connect your power switch right there. There's a power switch connector, and there's an LED connector as well. Plus, it looks like there is a, a header here for plugging in a cable like this, so you can just do away with the entire cutting your original power supply. You would just put this on uh, if you line it up correctly, like that, and then you just have to connect these up to the appropriate places on your motherboard. This is such an amazing and useful project. I have used these all over the place because it's so common for the old power supplies to die. For instance, I have a little Sun computer that was sent in on a mail call and the caps all leaked and totally destroyed everything inside there. There was so much corrosion, it is terrible. So pop one of these in there and you get all the voltages you need. It just freaking works. And sure enough, I need to finish that up and then make a video about it. I got that computer just powering up perfectly with one of these ATX4 VC adapters. So the early version that existed of these had the screw terminals, and I really hate those screw terminals because you, you know, you tighten them down, they bend and they, they're crappy. But these little ones here where you lift the lever and then you push it down to stick your wire in, these are fantastic. Looks like in here as well, we have a couple of the power switches. So these are what you would connect up to turn this thing off and on. And we have, looks like two of these boards. So thank you very much, Alan, for sending these. I know one of them is inside my Acorn Electron right now. I took the power supply out of that thing and I think I used one of these in there. And then the other one, I think I'm gonna put inside that Sun computer. And I have another one, the old version one with the screw terminals that I'm currently trying to, well, I was trying to get that Tandy 4000 motherboard powered up with that because that power supply was completely dead as well. So this just absolutely rocks. And it looks like we had a couple stickers here. Thanks for choosing the ATX4VC. For instructions, please visit ATX4VC.com. Scroll down and click user manuals under the title. And then for the other one, the ISA card here, we have PicoRC.com. So let's go check out the webpage here and uh, see what both of these are all about. Okay, so here we are looking at ATX4VC and it takes you right to GitHub, just going to that URL. And yep, it's just basically what I was explaining here. So we have all the various connections, including the power good signal that you can uh, wire up into your original computer. And yep, it's a USB-C and auxiliary power output. So you can run fans and LEDs and it gives you a fan header in there as well. And I know that it's pretty common for me to open up a power supply and work on it and stuff like that. And not everyone is really comfortable doing that because you're talking about mains voltage, there's capacitors and stuff like that. I totally understand that. And there are power supply replacements out there that exist, but well, they're typically kind of expensive and whatnot. And this project here, is so great because it's open source. So you can just buy them completed here and we have them on Tindy. Let's just go over to Tindy, take a look how much these cost. $35, I mean, how awesome is that? What's great about this too is an ATX power supply. You can use a full size one if you want to. You don't have to use a little Pico one. ATX power supplies can be pretty powerful devices. They can be like 350 watts. And you know, with an old retro computer, you don't really want to necessarily like have that much power available because if something shorts, it can be very, very destructive. So what's great on this project too, is we're talking it has fuses for each of the rails. So you can downsize those fuses or just automotive blade fuses to the appropriate value for your retro computer so that if something were to go seriously wrong, you wouldn't really need to worry. Now let's see what's going on here. So yeah, there's your old like dead power supply that doesn't work and all that caps and stuff. It's a real pain in the butt. And there you go. You can just replace it easy peasy with one of these solutions. Now what you would do is you would take these wires uh, that are coming into the power supply and you would connect them up to the little connector thing here, the little green thing. I've got this in camera view, you know, with the little levers and then you just bundle the wires together and stuff. This is obviously like an older version here, this picture here. Yeah, it looks like a bit of an older revision, but nonetheless, you can solder them directly on. You can use the little snap connectors. You can do all sorts. And in this particular power supply, whatever system this is for, this was the original AC mains power switch. Well, you just cut the wires off that and solder that onto the ATX power supply connector here. That's to turn your ATX power supply back and on, back, uh, on and off. And there's a Pico ATX power supply right there. It's plugged into the header. And this is the DC barrel jack. It's probably just using like a voltage switch or whatever with a little 3D printed bracket. And it's that easy and you get your system up and running. So there's the version here and there's how it looks with the wires plugged into it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I cannot say enough about what a great project this is. Absolutely fantastic. Now, there are all sorts of different versions available as well. And previously, Alan has sent in ones for like the Apple II GS, the Apple II, 
We can probably find those by taking a look in here. So Pico RC, I think this is the project. Yeah, for specific computers. Okay, here's what it's available for. The PC, the portable, the Apple IIs, the 2GS, the Mac Plus series. And yes, I only sent a bunch of these over to me. So they're, there were kits that I got and I've already built those up. The BBC Micro, the Mac SE, the Apricot machines as well. Well, that's an obscure computer. It's a UK computer. Uh, so there's that, there's the Osborne one. And let's check out the Apple, the uh, PC one that we just got here. So we'll take a look here, instructions. Did I click on it? Nope, I did not. Okay, here's the instructions. So there it is, there's that board, which we looked at. And there's the Pico ATX, which we plugged into it. And that's how it looks when it's installed. You got some LEDs, you have the power switch right there. It would no longer use the power switch on your main power supply. Although you could open it up, cut the wires, like in that other example, and run those over to this power switch right here, because it is a latching power switch. And then <laughs> you could totally use the old chunky power switch on your AT to power it up. Features that this thing has is, yes, it has an onboard minus five volt regulator. Most Pico ATXs will supply minus 12, but not minus five. And minus five is used for some sound cards on certain ISA applications. So it's pretty nice that that's there. This is a non-destructive mod, of course, so you don't have to even open your original power supply. You can just unplug it from the motherboard and completely replace it with this. So you can get a kit, which you can build yourself, we got some clips here on board. Oh yeah, so this allows you to clip onto the AC main switch if you want to use that. That's pretty sweet. So let's see here, it talks about how to assemble it. Excellent instructions. Oh, 5155 uses this uh, 12 volt header thing there, okay. And then here's the connection methodology. So you hook up the red, the orange, the black to the little spade connectors there. Uh, you install the little blank on the IEC mains thing, open your computer up plug it into the motherboard as seen. And then of course you have these wires which you've already connected. And what you do is you looks like you spread them open a little bit and then you need to plug them into the motherboard on the appropriate pin. So you plug one of the red wires into there, black wire there, power good right there, easy peasy, connect that up, make sure you do it correctly. I mean, the guides are excellent at getting these things installed as well. And it looks like you can use this on other machines as well. Like here's a Dell computer and some other stuff as well. It kind of explains how uh, the right way to hook this thing up to all of those, the Desk Pro as well. Oh, that is freaking awesome. You know, I had a Desk Pro, I think the original, not the 286, I had a Desk Pro XT or it's like 8086 or something. And the, the power supply died, the original power supply. And that power supply, I tried to fix it. It had a very complicated voltage comparison circuit and that was where the failure was. So it would turn on and then turn off because it thought the voltages were out of spec, but they were not. And I couldn't find schematics. I ended up giving up and just gutting the power supply itself and replacing it with another ATX power supply. So I just had a regular, you know, full-size ATX power supply and I put that inside of there and then I connected all the wires together. And I remember I had to make a little extra circuit for the power good. And um, I don't know if Alan has tested this on the compact because the power good signal was different somehow on than it was from ATX. And the system would turn on and then the green power LED on the computer would turn red as if it was like detecting some kind of a problem. And the machine was powered up, but it wouldn't actually boot. So I had to make a little circuit like an Arduino. I used an AT Tiny now I think about it to invert the signal or it had like a timing requirement. I forgot the exact details, but I never made a video about it, unfortunately. <laughs> and that might've been something that would've been useful. And yeah, and then, oh, look, even just bundle the wire inside so you don't have it floating around in the computer. <laughs> I absolutely love it. And then you can connect up the fan adder and there you go, you have a working system that's running off 12 volts DC. And the best thing about it, to be honest, besides the fact that you have know, a replacement modern power supply, you could run the entire computer off of USB power delivery. So you could use a USB power bank that's delivering 12 volts and uh, with a cable that goes to a, a 2.1 millimeter barrel jack. And then you could just have a portable IBM 5150. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is so freaking awesome. So as I mentioned as well, this is an open source project. So all of the schematics are available on here and the boards and stuff. So if you do wanna make your own, you absolutely can. But of course, just buying these kits is pretty inexpensive from Allen and essentially comes with all those fuses and fuse holders and connectors and all that stuff. It's already done for you. So it's pretty easy. And I have to say, I'm super impressed with the way this works on other systems as well. And for instance, here's one for the original Macintosh. It plugs right into the main board and you plug your Pico ATX into this. And then this goes off 
into your CRT board and it will power up the CRT itself and it sends the video signals as well. So you do not need to have a working power supply on your Macintosh original Macs. You can completely replace it with a Pico ATX. Like it's just very, very cool. Let's check out the Apple II one as well. Um, here's the Apple II one. It, it replaces the entire power supply. So this just sort of mounts into the back of the computer right there. And you have a barrel jack and a power switch. And then you do not need to worry about the whole power supply thing in the, in the Apple II, which, you know, people will go and replace the guts of it and stuff. And it's, you gotta open it up, it's a pain. You just take the whole thing out and pop this in there and you're done. This project is so cool because it's open source, it's inexpensive, it's very approachable because there's no mains voltages. You're all using 12 volt DC wall warts, like external power supplies with a barrel jack. Like there's just so many things that are, that are going into this that make it a great, great, easy to do thing for anyone. I know I said I was going to try this out, but I actually have to run because I have a live stream to do. So I gotta go. <laughs> I'm back from the live stream and I have the 46 DX266 motherboard out on the bench. It's the one I do all my testing with. Like I have a reset button connected and a speaker and stuff like that. So here's the card and I have it all connected up. Power good, ground in the middle and the five volts over here. And it's connected up to the requisite pins on the board. Just make sure you don't mix these up. You don't wanna give negative polarity into the motherboard. That would definitely destroy things. And I'm gonna put this into the slot closest to the power supply connection. So obviously if you were installing this in a machine, you'd want to uh, do some wire management to make this look a little bit neater. Because I don't have a Pico ATX power supply handy, I'm just gonna use my normal ATX bench supply here. This absolutely works. You don't need to use a Pico ATX. I have the postcard inserted into the motherboard so we can both see the voltage rails that are down there on those LEDs, plus if there's any postcodes. And I'm just going to double check that the connections I made are correct. So these go onto the motherboard just like that with the black wires in the middle here. And these red wires here are five volts, which is what I have hooked up to the red wire. And on this harness, the white wire here is actually the power good signal, which is the orange cable here. And just to double check, PG is power good. So that's the orange cable. Red is five volts and that's going correctly onto the motherboard there. And ground is going into the middle which is all correct. Now it's pretty funny hooking up this computer with this adapter with this card here, because honestly, this adapter here is easily available on eBay. I think that's where I bought this thing a number of years ago. And yeah, you just plug in any normal ATX power supply, including a Pico ATX. This does have a power switch right there for turning the system on and off. And this just goes into the standard AT power supply header. So what is the difference between using this and using this little board inside a machine like this? Well. The main reason why you'd want to is that most ATX power supplies now do not have a minus five volt rail. And that's what this regulator is right here. This should be a 7905. And yes, that's exactly what it is. And that takes the 12 volt rail, which almost all ATX power supplies have, even modern ones, and it converts that down to minus five volts and it injects that into the ISA bus right here. Now, most things on these systems do not use the minus five volt rail but sound cards often do. So if you use a regular ATX power supply with an adapter like this, and you plug in a sound card that needs that minus five volt rail, you're probably not gonna have working audio. Now, me personally, I have a stash of older ATX power supplies like this one, which you can see has minus five and it has minus 12. So using this with this adapter means that I have all the rails available and I don't need a voltage regulator. But Pico ATX power supplies are modern things and they don't normally have the minus five volt rail. And that's where this adapter comes into play. Now there are other existing solutions out there for getting minus five volts. If you have a ATX power supply and you're using an adapter like this and you only have the minus 12 and it plugs into the ISA slot, it takes the minus 12, converts that to minus five and then injects it back into the motherboard. That works as well. But what's really cool about this particular board, and I know we haven't even tested it yet, is that there are PCs out there that don't use the standard AT power connector. They use something else that's custom. And the Compact Desk Pro is something exactly like that. So with this solution, you're not limited to having a machine that has a normal AT power supply. You can actually use it on other things because you just have to clip these wires right onto whatever their existing connector is. That is what makes this such a cool, easy and flexible thing. And you don't have to worry about opening up the existing power supply and trying to replace the guts and you're dealing with mains voltages and you know, all that stuff. So, okay, enough talking. 
Let's test this out. So the mains are going to the ATX power supply. The switch is off here, so let's turn that on. Okay, nothing happened. That's good because I didn't know this power switch that's on this card here. I didn't know, well, you can't really see it, can you? <laughs> There's a switch right there, and I didn't know how it was set right now. So let's turn this on and hope that nothing fries. There we go. Yep, yeah, it's posting. You can see postcodes. It beeped. It's freaking working. <laughs> that is awesome. And switching the input, there it is. The system has booted up and it absolutely has worked. And of course, the power switch is on the back here. We just flip that down and you can see the lights have all turned off here. That absolutely works. It shut off the ATX power supply here. Turn this back on, there it is. It's absolutely working. And because I said this was possible, I wanna actually demonstrate this. So I have a Pico ATX power supply connected up and a 2.1 millimeter barrel jack. Uh, the reason for this uh, stupid adapter here is because someone had cut off the cable that went into this, which had a proper jack. So if I ever wanna reuse that properly, I will just need to install something correct on here. And once you have a correct jack, then you can install a panel mount type jack right there. So you can plug your DC right into the slot connector. Now for powering this thing with battery power, I have a USB-C power bank here and one of these cables, which essentially takes USB-C and there's a power delivery chip inside this jack here. So I can plug that in right there, plug this into that with the multimeter connected up to the Molex jack right here. And this is all currently powered off this power bank. If I turn this on, there we go. We're getting 12 volts out of the Molex there. And if we check the five volt rail, 5.06 volts. So yep, looks good. So just so you can see, we have USB-C at 12 volts coming out of this power bank, goes into the Pico ATX through this connector and into the motherboard and I have this reconnected. And if we turn this on, there we go. We have a working system and it's all from USB type C and it's booting up as you would expect. <laughs> and if I pull this out, once it's finished booting, there it is. I'll just pull this out of the power bank. There it is, it shuts down. How freaking awesome is that? So this particular power supply at 12 volts can only give three amps, which is only 36 watts. But I have a USB-C power meter here. So let's plug this thing in and let's see if we can figure out exactly how many watts is actually being drawn, at least by this particular setup here. So we're currently outputting about 0.6 watts and everything is turned off right now. And there's some draw on the Pico ATX. Let's turn this on and see what we go up to. 17 watts and it's dropped down a little bit, but the system is running right now. Looks like it bursts up to 20 watts at times. And your mileage will vary if this is going to work because we're at 20 watts right now. We're pretty close. Remember, it can go up to like 36 watts. And of course, there's going to be losses on these cables and stuff like that. So maybe you're only going to get about 30 watts. So if this is like some old power hungry system or you have hard drives connected, then it may not work very well. But this is a 46DX266. And the processor, which is um, out of view right here, right here, it gets pretty darn warm once this thing is running for a while. But it is interesting to know that a local bus video card, DX266, we have a post card in there. We have an IDE card with a compact flash card. We have this ROM card and well, that's it. And that's taking only about 20 Watts. And in case you think that doing something on this computer is gonna consume more power, that's not generally the case. And that's because old processors don't have power saving like new ones. They don't have these low power states that they go into. This thing is always just running at full speed, full power all the time. So on these old systems, processor power usage is pretty much constant. I think it was into the Pentium, Pentium 2 era where you started to have some amount of power saving going on. But even those things don't have variable clock speeds or anything like that. And I don't think this video card, which is a Sing Labs video card, also does anything. To, it's just always going to have the same exact power draw. And as the final step for the portable 46, I have a little battery powered VGA LCD screen here that's plugged in to the power bank. This happens to have a USB-A and a C output. And the Pico ATX is connected and I have this keyboard connected as well. And there we go. <laughs> Let's fix the glare a little bit by propping up the screen underneath something. Oh, it's still not very easy to see. Oh, <laughs> it's uh, it's inverted. All right, let's boot up some Doom all running off this little power bank right here. <laughs> there it is. If I had the Pico Gus card in there, we would have full sound as well. Isn't that freaking awesome? Yep. And uh, this was shrunk down because I was playing it on a 386. <laughs> 
Well, that is going to be it for this video. Alan, thanks very much for sending in this latest version of this adapter. I have to say, I am very impressed by it. I think it's uh, it's pretty great for regular people who just don't want to open up their power supplies. This will make it really easy as a way to get your old computer working. And of course, it allows cool stuff like this, battery-powered 486 DX266s. And yeah, those other ones that you sent in have been very valuable as well. In fact, I happen to have the Mac Plus one right here because I was just working on another video and I've shown this on the channel before, but this is the one for the Mac Plus. It's all built up and I have a little extra thing connected up here so I can plug in the RGB to HDMI directly to a Mac Plus. So I don't even need the entire analog board in the Mac Plus at all for doing testing of motherboards. And it works for the Mac 128, 512 and Mac Plus. Freaking awesome. So thanks again, Alan, for sending this stuff in. And thanks again, Mike, for sending in that 36DX motherboard that is in mint condition. What a score from a value village. That is pretty awesome. So that's gonna be for this mail call video. If you liked it, thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. They make it possible that I do this full time. So I am really grateful to them. If you wanna become a supporter as well, there's a link in the description below. In fact, the live stream I was talking about earlier was one that I did for my patrons. And this is, there's been a few days now, a gap between uh, recording this and that first part. But yeah, it's uh, pretty fun to do those live streams. And I have never done any live streams for the general channel, but it's one of the perks for the higher tiers of my patrons. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Comment down below if you have thoughts about all this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, I guess that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.